Hello everyone, welcome to Talk HR UK. My name's Simon Gear, and when I'm not enjoying wonderful podcasts with HR leaders, I am helping HR directors, managing directors and CEOs source the best HR talent in the southeast of the UK. Today, I am delighted to introduce Jenny Davidson. Hi, Jenny. Hello, Simon. Nice to be here. Thanks for coming on. And um, I've known Jenny, it's a few years now, actually. Jenny is... Um, uh, a, a senior reward professional who's worked for a number of well-known blue chip organizations, most recently three, I think, but also uh, Virgin Atlantic, Dixon's Carphone, Talk Talk, which I think is when we first started talking to each other, Jenny, and then yep. DXC Technology and Honeywell going right back. Um, now, alongside uh, Jenny's reward leadership work, you've had a bit of a change career-wise recently, and you've, you've moved into... Uh, a new angle really of your career so you're working as a pensions trustee executive and um, we thought it would be a really good idea to to bring something out about this because this is really key for any HR leader who has an involvement in the running of their organization's pensions offering basically yeah. so thanks Jenny um, over to you I guess tell us about your pensions trustee work you know how did you get here when did you start to follow this path yeah, so it's, it's quite a new path for me, very new. So I, I started my career in, in, in pensions, working in pensions administration and then moving into pensions management. Uh, my first group pensions manager role was with a building materials group called... Uh, called Caradon that then became Nova that then became Honeywell so uh, and um, over time I realized that with final salary and defined benefit pensions disappearing I needed to broaden my horizon so I, I moved into reward and, and as you said in, in the introduction that that's where I've been for about the last 10 years still having responsibility for pensions but but not as detailed in, into the you know technical piece um, and then I guess I got to that stage of my life where people start to think about portfolio careers of NED and board positions and so I thought well why not use the experience and the knowledge that I've got in pensions and sit on some trustee boards rather than corporate boards and um, you know sort of help sponsors and and help members make sure that they're getting the best out of those trustee boards so I, I joined Best Trustees uh, back in October um, they're a very small niche company, about 30 employees who all sit on a variety of different trustee boards. Excellent. Okay. So if, you, if I was an HR director now, sort of hearing this, why should we consider appointing a, a professional pensions trustee to help run our internal pension scheme? I mean, because obviously there's a cost. You know, it's another thing we've got to spend money on for external expertise. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, well it, well, it is an additional cost um, compared to asking one of your own, you know, maybe senior finance employees to sit on the trustee board. But there's a couple of reasons. I think, first of all, it's quite a challenge for some uh, employees to sort of fit it in with their day jobs. We've all got sort of court, busy corporate lives and, you know, has, have people actually got the time to dedicate to sit on the trustee board as, as well as their uh, their normal role. Uh, but Probably more importantly, that the whole he the whole area has got so much more complex, um, partly due to the pensions regulator uh, and all the guidance they put out, but but also more recently, just the impact of of coronavirus and and the fact that um, you know businesses uh, are now in a in a difficult position, some of them in a distressed position even, and therefore you know if you can pay for a little bit of expertise up front. To sit on your trustee board perhaps that might reduce the risk of things going wrong in, in the future um, which obviously can cause sort of reputational damage to a company as well as a you know as a costly costly business risk so for risk management reasons i think predominantly it's a good point actually as they say there's so much to consider i mean you mentioned there has been a real increase really in terms of governance around pension schemes what should what should organisations be aware of there? Um, well, I think um, obviously back in April time, um, there was a lot of volatility in, in the investment markets, and I think companies and and pension providers found that members were were phoning up and a little bit panicking. And I think back at that time, it was really just trying to uh, put out the message that you know sort of 
keep calm if you like and um you know and uh, uh, and don't really panic um and the pensions regulator put out some advice back in april to give some breathing space really for for companies to say if you are trying to fund a, a deficit in your pension scheme you know you can actually have a bit of breathing space and take a bit more time um, but since then, the regulator has come out and said that it does expect trustees to take on much greater scrutiny of, of the company and um, expects them to be engaging with, with the employer um, you know, much earlier on if there's any signs of potential financial distress. So, um, so you know, coronavirus has, has um, brought about a lot of change. But there's, there's other things as well. I mean, we, if people who listen to the, um, the funding, the, the spending review, sorry, early, earlier in the week uh, and the um, Chancellor's announcement about the change in the retail price index. OK, that's not until 2030, but it does have some major impacts on, on, on pension schemes. And, and therefore, you know, HR directors need to sort of find out whether that's going to impact their pension scheme or not. So. So it's not just the, sort of the, the governance area, it's, it's what's happening, at, you know, day to day, really, keeping on top of that. Exactly. And yeah, and you mentioned the pandemic there. I mean, clearly, it's a huge impact on, on all areas of every business, really. I, I mean, particularly in this space. How do you think organisations can keep their employees engaged during um, something like the pandemic, you know, engage with their pension scheme? Because it's very important to, to maintain a relationship as such, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, as an industry, I, I, I think everyone was expecting um, when the pandemic first hit for, for pension scheme members to, to maybe opt out of the pension scheme, but we definitely haven't seen that happen. So we right. definitely know that people are engaged in their pension. They are continuing to... Uh, you know, to to, to spend uh, spend some of the money into their pension pot, but I guess it's thinking about what impact this pandemic might have over the next couple of years on the economy, and um, you know how that might impact employees and their spending. So the, there's there's quite a lot of um, innovation out there at the moment, and I think it's looking at the financial well-being in a holistic sense. So giving employees the tools to be able to think about uh, their spending and their saving habits uh, and just really thinking about the, you know, the future over the, over the next couple of years and, and, and how to keep people engaged. Um, and there is some real interest in innovation coming about. So, you know, one little bit of innovation I, I saw recently was uh, enabling employees to, to save um, part of their salary each month into a, into a bit of a savings pot and they had a target to say well I want to you know save a thousand pounds to buy a new car and once okay. they got to that um, that limit rather than stop saving the idea was you continue to save your 10 or 20 pound a month but it goes into your pension pot instead of your savings pot so mm -hmm. I think it's really looking at that whole holistic um, financial well-being piece will keep people engaged it's it's good that you mentioned that. And I, I mean, I, I was on a, the, the podcast I recorded for last week was all about uh, mental health and well-being. But I was amazed how much financial well-being was coming up, actually, as, as something that HR directors need to factor into their, their people strategies for 2021, I suppose. So, uh, yes, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the things we spoke about when we were thinking through this session were, were things like pension scams. I mean, they, that seems to have gone up doesn't it? There's been a lot of uh, increase in pension scams recently, particularly in the press, it's been reported. Um, what can organisations do to, to protect their employees from that kind of activity? Yeah, well, well unfortunately, the pandemic has been a period where, um, you know, it's been exploited a bit by scammers. And uh, that's particularly true with, with pension scams. And I think we're all quite used to being aware of any banking scams that might be going on and we're reluctant to give any of our details out over the phone whereas you know we would, probably wouldn't have been as, as well aware of that you know sort of 10 years ago um, but there are you know a, a really large number of pension scams that have been recorded and I, I think the number was something like 30 million um, has been the latest number of pension really? scams that, that have been reported to action fraud and so therefore you know there's probably more than that because some of it's probably gone unreported 
Um, and the, the scams can be persuading people to transfer their pension pot into either uh, pension vehicles that don't exist or, or ones that really aren't going to give people the outcomes that, that they were expecting. Um, so what can um, HR directors and, and companies do? I think it's about raising, raising awareness. Um, there is actually a really nice little leaflet, very simple leaflet out there on the FCA website uh, called right. um, Being Scam Smart. So I would definitely encourage people if they haven't seen that to, to download that little leaflet. And, and that would be a great tool to use with employees to you know, just make them more aware of the issue if they're not already. Excellent. Thanks for that uh, useful tip, because, as you say, it's a, it's a key area that's uh, so it's not going to get any better without it being tackled, really. So an, another area we spoke about that we, were, we both actually you know, had quite good, view, strong views on, really, was, is climate change. Now, this is becoming, you know, is, is moving higher up the agenda uh, for all organisations now and forms often a, a very key part of a, a firm's um, kind of CSR strategy, I suppose, moving forward. From a pensions perspective, you know, how, how can um, pensions providers, schemes and trustees help effectively? What's the role of, of pensions trustees in climate change and environmental issues? Yeah, well, I think everyone understands now the, the economic as well as the uh, human cost of, of climate change. And if we think about the position that the pension scheme trustees are in with, with trillions of, of pounds worth of pensions money in the industry, then arguably they should be able to have some influence over where they're investing. Yeah, a big chunk of the investment money is, is in stocks and shares of businesses, is in credit of businesses, and therefore, you know, they are very well placed to be able to influence companies and, and influence where that investment is going in the future. Um, the issue that trustees have at the moment is there isn't really sufficient data and transparent data out there for them to be able to really understand how uh, climate change uh, can be translated into, the, into where they're investing. So there's a huge movement in the industry at the moment to get that transparency uh, and for trustees to be able to understand how where they're investing is ultimately impacting climate change. So, so an area um, you know that's going to be hugely developed over the over the next twelve months to to, to two years, um, and I, and I think the profile of this really is being raised within employees. I think Richard Curtis, who's the the, the film director, um, the guy who started Comic Relief as well, so he mm. started this campaign, uh, make my money matter. Um, Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was very shortly after the Black Lives Matter campaign started. So I think perhaps that spurred him on to think about make my money matter. Um, and, you know, there's a website and it is a campaign. So he's trying to get people um, to sign up to say, actually, where I invest in my pension, I want that money to matter and, and to try and have a voice and, uh, and to influence. So um, it might be that HR directors are starting to get questions from their employees mm. who might have heard of this sort of high profile um, campaign and uh, want to know how, how, you know, how they can get involved. So a very, very topical issue, but one I think that's going to develop quite a lot over the next couple of years. Definitely. And it's, it's funny you mentioned that, I mean, G Generation Y, I suppose, or, or Millennials, as they're often known, they, they seem far more inclined than perhaps my generation were in, in terms of, and, and rightly so, in fairness, in terms of where their money's invested, how it's invested um, with their pension funds, Again, with this more values driven employee, what can organizations do uh, alongside external factors like the Richard Curtis campaign to, to support this kind of values driven movement really? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, if I go back to my last role um, at, at three before before moving into the pension trustee role, um, we got so much engagement when um, uh, deciding to do anything in relation to um, climate change. So one of the things we did was was changed all the the plastic and the non-recyclable um, 
uh, stuff in the canteen and the coffee bar and and put a whenever we put notes out about it on the internet it was absolutely the most hit article on the internet so really? so there is a lot of there's a lot of interest and as you say there's a lot of people thinking about you know values and, and values driven movement at the moment I, I think for hr directors and hr um you know the hr function in general i think it's about being transparent listening listening to your employees and giving them a voice whether that be through um sort of um, employee listening sessions, employee surveys that might be done from time to time, or even sort of town halls where senior management might be taking questions and answers. I think it's just letting people have that voice, um, but then acting on it, you know, even if it's just acknowledging what you've heard, even if you aren't able to take any action, I think that is, um, you know, that, that is definitely advisable. The last thing people want to do is give their feedback and then not understand it's been listened to. So. I think it's all about listening and, and being transparent and having a voice. I'd agree with you. And, and, and again, re sort of relating this back to other podcasts I've been involved with, it comes up time and time again that, as you say, the, the forum for communication and then acting upon it seems yeah. to be a real, you know, a real focus for HR teams going forward, I think. So um, well, well, let's, let's take it back to your, your technical area of expertise. So um, master trusts or, or, or multi-employer pension schemes. What, what should organisations know about those at this point? Uh, well, Simon, I think uh, this probably could be a podcast in its own, its own right. So, uh, but, but in a nutshell, rather than um, having your own pension scheme for, for you as an employer, if you're able to combine the assets of all of a number of different employers on, under one of what's called these new master trusts, then that obviously gives um, economies of scale. And the master trusts are, are still run by a set of trustees um, and, the, and the master trust has to have to be authorised by the pensions regulator. So companies and members can be quite sure that the governance, that they're going to be well run as their own, you know, in a single employer scheme is well run but it has the advantages of, of, of economies of scale and also the providers are really investing in this area at the moment so there's a lot of comp competition for um, assets under management to be put on the platform and therefore the charges are quite competitive really and, and also they're investing a lot in the technology, the tools, the education. So an employer on its own might not have the bu budget to spend on a lot of communication and engagement. Um, and therefore these master trusts who have got more money to spend on the platform and are evolving the platform, um, you know, the, the, it will give employees uh, access to those tools and, and that education. And for the company, it's kind of moving the governance away to, you know, a third party to, to outsource that governance to. So it kind of feels to me like it's a bit of a win-win for, for employees and also for companies. That's excellent. So it could lighten that load of time and effort put into it. And, uh, and as you say, the, the um, economics of it could be beneficial. Yeah, you know, definitely. Yeah. Especially in this age. Okay, so... Finally, then, I'm asking everyone this at the end. So your, your recommendations, I suppose, from both a pensions and a reward perspective, perhaps, um, to the HR pr profession for next year, for 2021, in terms of um, what they need to be thinking about, what action they can start planning for and, and start taking now? Yes, I think it's, uh, it's probably a difficult one to advise on because I think it's going to be a very difficult, bumpy economic road. For the next year for 2021 um, we don't Agreed. obviously know how much longer it's going to be before um, you know there is a there is a vaccination available and you know how long people are going to be um, uh, you know employed whether there's going to be great redundancies etc so I think we all need to be aware that it's going to probably be a, a bumpy ride so I think the best advice I can give is um, think about your your spend on your employees and, and where it's best focused to get the best engagement so you know uh, there might be some difficult decisions to make around pay review we've heard obviously about the public sector um, having a pay freeze with the exception of the NHS um, the national minimum wage has, has just gone up 
at a lower level than I think people were expecting. Uh, and I'm sure there will be some companies out there who, who will not be increasing salaries this year. So, so what can you do with, with limited spend to, to keep your employees as, as engaged uh, as you can be? Um, and I think there's going to obviously be companies out there who will have to make the difficult decision to make people redundant. And I think it's just making sure that that is handled with respect. Uh, the more transparent and open you can be as part of that consultation process, then, you know, I think you'll get the respect back from the employees as well. Um, and finally, but probably most importantly, I, I think um, the HR community needs to look after itself, both mentally and, and physically, so that they can be as productive as they are. Uh, working from home in this strange remote environment and with all of the stuff that I'm sure is going to be thrown at us during 2021. So kind of keep calm and look after yourself, I think would be my uh, my best advice. It's a good mantra. Keep calm and look after yourself. I quite like that. And it's and again, I have to admit, over the last probably two to three weeks, all my conversations with with HR professionals yeah you're, you're you've said it well they're, they're tiring a little bit it's been a hard year there's a lot going on we're back in a second lockdown there's been returns to the office moving back away from it from again lots of change restructure transformation so yeah i, I think you're right they need to take some time themselves to to ensure they're ready for what next year brings yeah and, definitely uh, definitely deliver well, hey, hey, thanks so much for your time. I know you've been really busy, uh, particularly, you know, with your, this new line of business for you, if you like, and this new area of expertise. But it's great to, to have some time with you and, and good luck with that. Uh, are you enjoying it all so far? Because it's a, it's a bit of a change, isn't it? Yeah, it is a change. No, it, it is really good. I mean, I'm obviously building up my portfolio. That was the idea of, of joining um, to build up your portfolio of sort of pension scheme clients. So that in itself is quite exciting. You're sort of re-networking with people I haven't spoken to for a while and uh, letting people know what I'm doing. So that's nice as well. And, and they're a lovely company uh, to work for, Best Trustees. So uh, yeah, so having a good time at the moment. Fantastic. Well, hey, look, hope it continues to go well. Thanks so much for giving us a bit of time today. I'm, I'm assuming if there's anyone there that wants to make contact or reach out linkedin is probably a great place to start you're on linkedin aren't you jenny so, yeah i'm all over linkedin every day so <laughs> wonderful but um, obviously we'll we'll share the podcast with our networks and um, i look forward to catching up with you again you know somewhere between now and the uh, the festivities is not far away yeah thanks a lot simon thanks jenny all the best